Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Visualize more biomarkers and extract more insights. Moving from single marker IHC to multiplex IF. My name is Christy Jewell, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by AltaView. For more information on our sponsor, please visit altaview.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Also, please notice, you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of your presentation window, or you can report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Scott Lawrence, Associate Scientist, Cancer Genomics Research Laboratory, Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, NCIFNLCR, Lidos Biomedical Research, and Dr. Katir Patel, Associate Director, Biomarker Strategy and Applications, AltaView. For complete biographies on our speakers, visit the bi Biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, gentlemen. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Christy, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to attend our webinar today. As we all know, the tumor microenvironment is incredibly complex and is characterized by complex amine phenotypes, dynamic cell-to-cell -cell interactions, and ever-changing tumor evasion mechanisms. Further adding to this complexity is the number of different treatment strategies and therapies that have been developed in the immuno-oncology field. This creates a significant challenge in determining the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Multiplex IHC is a tremendous tool to help address this specific type of problem. Multiplexing allows for a deep characterization of each unique tumor microenvironment while maintaining spatial context. The biological insights that can be pulled from this information is incredibly powerful. And on that note, I would like to highlight a very simple yet elegant example of this. Here we have a melanoma that's been stained with our in situ plex technology. What you're seeing is DAPI in blue, Granzyme B in that uh, green color you can see there in the lower bar, uh, lower uh, legend, CD3 in red, and SOX10 uh, melanoma <clears throat> tumor marker in a light blue cyan color. Within this melanoma, we are capturing a biological event visual by visualizing cell-to-cell -cell interactions in context while maintaining that spatial resolution I mentioned earlier. I'm going to zoom into a very specific region within the center of this image. Here we can see the immune response with a cytotoxic T cell recognizing and preparing to attack in a budding tumor cell. What you're actually visualizing in red is the CD3 positive T cells clustered around a group of SOX10 positive melanoma cells. In the very center, you can see that um, the membranes of the CD3 positive T cell that it has granzyme B polarizing to the membrane, uh, to the lower membrane side, abutting a SOX10 positive tumor cell. What you're seeing is a cytotoxic T cell recognizing preparing to attack that specific tumor cell. We can clearly see the immune recognition demonstrated by the alignment and flattening of these two membranes. The ability to multiplex the numerous markers, some of which co-express on the same cell, on the same slide allows us to visualize this type of immune response and see this immune recognition and reaction to this particular tumor. That's a simple uh, example of why being able to multiplex within this field of immuno-oncology is incredibly important. There are a variety of multiplexing platforms that are currently available in the, within the market. Um, there are many different considerations to evaluate when trying to decide on a particular type of platform that is best for evaluating your own specific research goals and needs. Um, 
AltaView has been really founded on a foundation of evaluating all the platforms that are currently available and picking and choosing the best features of all of them and adapting to what the specific needs of our researchers today in the immune oncology field are requiring. Some of the key areas to consider when looking at different platforms is, you know, a high level of multiplexing, be able to, to specifically target numerous markers and adjust the level of plexing quite easily. We also want to be making sure we can have whole slide imaging. We can see clear and uh, very uh, defined cell morphology. We can visualize cell-to-cell -cell interactions and really characterize any types of immune infiltrations and unique characteristics of the tumor microenvironment. Other considerations where I think many other platforms uh, fail to, to, really, to really establish a wider breadth of uh, usage in the space is in workflow compatibility. You want a workflow that is very simple and can work with, you know, many pieces of instruments that you already have within your own laboratories. And then on top of that, really from a data deep dive perspective, you want to be able to identify complex phenotypes. And this requires the ability to, co uh, to visualize co-expressing and co-localizing markers, as well as see different things like differential expression of certain types of functional markers, such as PDL1. To highlight some of the technology, um, some of the technology advantages that UltraV presents, uh, we're showing a melanoma stained with our uh, PD-1 kit, which has CD3 in red, CD45 RO in green, and PD-1 in that light blue cyan color. We've actually dropped off the tumor marker in this case, uh, just to allow for a little bit more clarity and visualization. On this slide, I'm really hoping for you to be able to visualize the co-localizations of some of these markers, as well as seeing some of the indications of dynamic range from a qualitative sense. What I'm highlighting here are some single positive CD3 positive T cells. Here we're seeing some dual positive CD3 and CD45 RO memory T cells. And please keep in mind when you're visualizing these and any of these analysis type softwares and tools, um, you can actually get new colors when you stack two colors on top of each other. So when you have red and green, for example, you get this yellow color presenting a, a co-localization of two markers. We're also seeing exhausted suppressor T cells that are CD3 and PD1 positive here, and they're in that pink to purple color. And then we're also seeing triple positive cells that are here in this white color. One of the other things I'd also like to highlight as you're kind of visualizing or you know, walking yourself through this image, you'll see slides that is, you'll see cells of different colors and different color variations. You'll see some that are more orange, some that are more pink, some that are more purple. Uh, that is very qualitative, you know, kind of just your eye test showing that there is a significant dynamic range within the staining of our assay here. That you can see low expressors to medium expressors and high expressors. And now if you were to plug this into any sort of standard analysis tool, you'd really be able to further dive into that and really start to threshold and sub-categorize uh, these different ranges of expression into new unique cell populations. One of the other pieces I'd also like to highlight was workflow that I had mentioned earlier. So the UltiMapper and UltiView technology can be run uh, automated on the Bond RX or manually, and it's a very simple, fast assay, about five and a half hours. Um, whole slide imaging, it can be done on any whole slide imaging platform. Uh, it does not require any types of spectral mixing, so your basic whole slide scanners are fully adaptable to, to this platform. And image analysis is completely user dependent. This is really showing the fact that we can um, use a very, we can have a very agnostic approach to being able to deploy our assay to a variety of research laboratories with a variety of different configurations as far as workflow goes. What we present here is a standard workflow that's very amendable to standard histopathological workflows that we see in the clinic today. So now to give you an uh, overview of the UltiMapper assay itself, it is actually quite simple. UltiView uses antibodies that are conjugated to unique single-stranded DNA barcodes that you can see there on the left. Um, these unique DNA barcodes are unique to each individual antibody. So each antibody has its own unique DNA signature just like people do. So CD4 would have its own signature, CD3 would have its own signature, CD8 would have its own signature. Uh, this allows us to eliminate the need to use any sort of secondary antibody, which helps eliminate things like nonspecific and background staining. This also allows us to use any species of antibodies we see fit. They could be all of mouse, or rabbit, monoclonal, does not matter. Species is completely independent. Um, the assay itself also allows us to do a single cocktail antibody staining step, 
and also only utilizes a single antigen retrieval step. There are no rounds of stripping antibodies off and restaining. This is a single primary antibody staining step that, follow, that, that immediately follows a single antigen retrieval step. Once our primary antibodies are, have been bound, we actually go through an amplification step where we amplify the DNA barcodes via tandem repeats. This, is, this amplification is just an amplification of that single-stranded DNA. So it's a single-stranded DNA that will be amplified. And this amplification is linear and it occurs at the same rate and at the same time for all targets that are there. This is actually quite interesting, especially when we're discussing things like dynamic range. This linear amplification allows us to see a wide variety of expression of you know, certain functional markers such as PDL1. It allows us to differentiate low to medium to high expressors because of this linear amplification. In comparison, when you're using something like an HRP conjugate, that type of amplification is actually quite, is generally much more geometric, meaning it tends to hit saturation quite quickly. Um, and that means your medium to high or medium expressors tend to hit saturation quite easily. And it's harder to decipher or separate the range of expression between those types of cells. Now, getting back to what we have here, uh, we also have a single detection step. And our detection step is also quite simple. It's a simple DNA hybridization where we use complementary strands called imaging strands that have fluorophores conjugated to each one of them that will go in and hybridize to their specific DNA complementary standard, DNA barcode that we were talking about earlier. Uh, we simply use a FITSI, a TRITSI, a Psi-5, Psi-7 uh, type of uh, fluorophore scheme, meaning we don't need to do any spectral mixing because these fluorophores are very well isolated and do not have any sort of spectral overlap or bleed through. And this allows us to go ahead and visualize the targets we had laid down at the initial step. And also another thing to consider with this assay is that since we're not using secondaries, we're not providing any sort of covalent, we're not providing a technology that causes any sort of covalent bounding or caking of things like such as, you know, a ceramide platform may do, it allows us to quite easily co-localize numerous markers within even the same cellular compartment at the same time. And this technology also allows for the tissue to be main, maintaining very, very good tissue quality and integrity, meaning that the assay can be used for other downstream types of analyses. We've had a number of customers that have actually started stacking things like ish um, and fish and things like that after running our fluorescence assay. Um, as you can imagine, only having a single round of antigen retrieval keeps that tissue quite well intact. One of the simpler things that we do on a regular basis is we run h and E's of the same slide. Right. So m many workflows that people have seen working with fluorescence, they'll typically have a serial section that is stained in H and E that is generally very, very good for the pathologist to go back and review. Um, pathologists are trained in bright field. They're, they're trained in pattern recognition. And sometimes fluorescence can be a quite different uh, platform to interpret and read. So being able to get an H and E of the exact same slide um, you're doing your fluorescence assay on has been a tremendous asset. Uh, to our pathologist friends out there that are adopting or, you know, working with fluorescent-based assays. And to, and to kind of highlight that, I want to show is a very nice registration of the fluorescence overlaid a, an H&E. And there's nothing unique about this protocol. So we run our standard fluorescent assay, and following that, we can actually just decouple the slip to side and run a standard H&E protocol to be able to get this functionality and visualization done. So Altaview's current portfolio has been designed around really focusing on the major areas of research in immuno-oncology today. That's allowed us to derive a number of different kits that are specifically designed to help answer specific questions that are generally faced by most immuno-oncologists in the market as we see today. But that's something that we've uh, quickly learned is not, not enough for what people are currently doing. Uh, we have a services business that currently runs up to eight plex assays, and it's expanded its uh, capabilities to a fixed 12 plex assay. Um, our services business can provide staining, imaging, as well as analysis. And so those are all things you can feel free to reach out to us afterwards to discuss. But what we quickly found out is that, you know, running standard four plex assays in the field um, is something is leaving customers wanting more. 
based upon the demands that we're seeing from the field and our customers, and specifically with some of the help from Scott Lawrence and his team over at Lidos, we've been able to start to deploy a higher plex workflow to the field. This, like I had mentioned before, it was standardly a services offering for all of you, but now we're expanding this higher plex workflow to the field, allowing customers to run eight plex panels in their own laboratories. And so quickly, um, and Scott will touch upon this later in his presentation, I'd like to walk you through how we actually achieve an 8-plex uh, without the need to do things like spectral admixing or stripping or restaining of antibodies. So to start, we still start with a single DWAX and antigen retrieval step. We can still apply a single uh, cocktail of primary antibodies. And in this case, we're actually going to apply eight antibodies at the same time versus four. We will also still follow that up with a single amplification step where we amplify all eight targets at the same rate, same time. And again, that's a linear amplification. But when we come to visualization, this becomes a two-step process. In the first round, we will actually go ahead and image four of the eight markers that are down on the tissue, just in the same method that we had described before, using complementary imaging strands with fluorophores conjugated to them. We will acquire that image on the fluorescent scanner, and then we will run through a process called exchange, where we do a mild signal removal, which dehybridizes those imaging strands and removes all that fluorescent signal. This leaves all those amplified DNA barcodes intact, even the ones we just visualized. What we will do next is we'll actually come in with a second set of imaging strands, but these imaging strands are specific to the second set of markers we did not visualize in the first round, so the second set of four. We are still using the same standard FITSI, TRITSI, SI5, SI7 fluorophores, but this time they're specific to a different set of antibodies. Once, once we have those down, we'll actually do another round of imaging, and then we will co-register the two images and fuse them into a single image where we can begin to work our analysis. So you will have an eight-plex, eight-marker assay on a single slide. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Scott Lawrence, and he will be touching on this as well as a lot of the great work him and his team have been undertaking over the last year, year and a half since we've been working with them. Thank you. Okay, great, and hello, and thanks, Katir, for the great overview of UltraView technology. Today, I'll be discussing how my lab utilizes three assays for evaluating protein expression on histological slides. As this technology has grown from single-plex IHC to the current state of running 30-plus markers on a single slide, the scope, fidelity, and resolution of data that can be extracted has grown. We'll be taking a look at these technologies and contrast them, taking a quick look at the strengths and weaknesses of each. But first, we have the requisite disclaimer slide to go over. I want to show that for a little bit. So with my group um, at MDPL, we are a full service histology lab that primarily supports DCEG researchers, which is the Division of Epidemiology and Genetics as part of the NCI, with their pathology-based studies. It was decided early on to build the group to be fully digitally integrated from the wet labs through pathology and data analysis. For chromogenic analysis, we provide routine h &E staining for manual pathology assessment. Also, we support singleplex and duplex IHC for marker analysis. We are excited to be working with UltraView, <clears throat> bringing multiplex immunofluorescence <clears throat> this year to the lab. While these technologies have their role in the lab, in general terms, as we move from H&E to multiplex IF, we're able to get more data from each slide, but often sample quality needs to be higher and lower slide throughput should be expected. Image analysis in our lab is supported by HALO, along with R and Tableau for data analysis. While the trend for data density and complexity moves towards multiplex IF and beyond, advances in deep learning and AI analysis promises to yield more data from all these technologies and is something we're exploring in future technologies. Even with multiplex IF assays capable of generating data from eight plus markers from a single slide, there's still a role for singleplex IHC. Simply, a singleplex IHC is fast and robust. Here, we have optimized our PDL1 assay across multiple clones and run concentrations 
looking at the optical density and positive counts using our calibrator slide. The analysis is straightforward and clearly one can see two clones failed and moved us closer to solidifying our run conditions. To the right is a typical output from our analysis software and some of the metrics we generate when we run a singleplex IHC. While singleplex IHC excels for analyzing a standalone marker, it isn't necessarily the best technology to use when multiple markers need to be considered. Here we provide some archival images that we are hopeful to run spatial analysis across the markers. But once we took a quick look, we realized that this set would not be suitable for multi-marker spatial analysis studies. A quick glance at the image series notes that multiple issues from incomplete sections, section vibration artifact, and inconsistent background staining. Alone, these issues present their own challenges and are further compounded when trying to get associations between markers. When considering running a multi-marker analysis with singleplex IHC, the experiment should be implemented with this expectation. But even with the best expectation, there is a risk that subsequent, subsequent sections will be compromised and may not be suitable for registration and spatial analysis. Consider minimizing the number of sections needed, which will limit the amount of markers that can be compared. It is also noteworthy how marker expression can change from section to section. In this data, we wanted to see how the masked um, regions of CK positive, denoted by red staining, and how the marker expression within here PDL1 with DAB would change the more distal we went from the origin section. At section one, one section apart rather, we do not see a large difference in marker expression roughly 4%, but by the time the sections are 20 apart, around 100 microns in total, the tissue composition and alignment have largely shifted from the origin section, and we see an increase in marker area difference. It might be hard to see, but note that the loss of the stromal tract from the annotated boundary when sections are 20 apart. Large changes in morphology can certainly alter biomarker expression when doing these focused region studies with single-plex chromogenic IHC. Needle core biopsies have special considerations when considering multiple slides, as they tend to be thinner and with less representative tissue content. We looked at a number of needle biopsies to see if we could correlate nucleic acid yields to tissue density. From these studies, we looked at how the tissue area changes at 10 and 20 sections away from the origin section. At 10 sections away, approximately 26% of the biopsies had an area difference of greater than 20%. By the time we were 20 sections away, in some cases more, 64% of the core biopsies had a tissue area change of greater than 20%. The large changes in frequency and tissue area observed in the core biopsies was attributed to the initial biopsy size and how the biopsy was oriented, whether flat or tilted, or whether fragmented or intact. Due to the nature of needle biopsies, it is less likely that these would be suitable for multi-marker single-plex IT studies that require spatial analysis. For this, we moved to running a duplex IHC. For the next study presented, we explicitly sought to run a serial spatial analysis across eight markers, six of which are shown here. Each analytical marker was paired with a PAN-CK as a duplex IHC. After scanning, the images were aligned and then registered. With analysis, we created two data sets. The top one, which has PAN-CK on each side, we were able to create to get each analytical marker's relationship with cytokeratin, including within, outside, and proximal to. On the bottom one, we also generate a spatial map for all the analytical markers to observe relationships between the cell subpopulations. The primary advantage over singleplex IHC was to confidently analyze for our key metric, 
the marker relationships to cytokeratin with less concern in changes to tissue morphology or drop section. As an added benefit, we were able to get some interesting data on the spatial orientation between these markers. Ultimately, however, a new population of cells gets sampled at each section, preventing multimarker single cell phenotyping, as we'll get into in the next slide. Here is the same registered image stack up close. While the sections are fairly close, they are not perfect. At close inspection, we can see a different population of cells being sampled with each section. Though it appears at least two sections have the same cell being representative, uh, by far most of them are not being sampled twice. Having the phenotyping marker PAN-CK here in a duplex IC is helpful for doing targeted region analysis, but for looking at single cell phenotyping, we need a different technology. And that's where uh, multiplex IF comes in. The multiplex IF has a number of advantages over the prior two technologies. Key to this technology, at least for my group, are the tissue conservation and single cell phenotyping with multiple markers. Also, preserving sample integrity when considering orthogonal analysis such as downstream genomics is very useful. But multiplex IF is not without concerns. Loss of morphological contact content compared with chromogenic assays can be an issue. This can be mitigated by registering an HNE slide for multiplex IF image or just having one of them as an adjacent section. Slide throughput can be a concern if the lab, run, lab runs 100 to 1,000 slides weekly. Uh, multiplex IF prompts thoughtful experimental design. Due to the cost and the previously mentioned throughput, it is not often practical to run every slide possible and filter the date, data later. Though cost issues are debatable since less slides are being used overall. Another con not listed here is the increase in image file sizes needing larger data storage. Large files can take time to move and storage can be limiting. Advances in storage technology and or leveraging cloud storage can be a loose solution for some groups. So here we ran a pilot study with UltaView uh, roughly a year ago using their Ultimapper IO PDL1 kit. So this kit it stands for PDL1, CD68, CD8, and PAN-CK, along with DAPI for the nuclei. Using our analysis software, we analyzed for marker spatial relationships to cytokeratin, as the top figure shows, and we're able to phenotype each cell and count the population of phenotypes represented in each core. Expanding this analysis to the entire TMA and associating available metadata, we developed a high-level understanding of multi-tumor response with these critical markers. We plan to expand testing to TMA specific to breast and lung cancer to get a broader understanding and assess assay performance on these cancers specifically. Of course, the TMA does not fully detect the heterogeneity, heterogeneity we'll see in a test population, but the quality of the staining and analysis possibilities prompted us to move forward with UltraView and putting together an APLEX panel to run in production. But before I get to the APLEX panel and a preview of what that looks like, I'd like to contrast conventional multiplex IF with UltraView IF, um, as traditionally getting into multiplex IF uh, was challenging and cumbersome to many groups. So conventional IF can take months to get to production. Shown is an example of a fourplex arrangement to assess for background staining and signal crosstalk. Panels like this can be rearranged multiple times during optimization, and it can often be challenging to find the optimum floor floor to target and to balance marker expression. Here is an example of, of how all floor floors are not created equal with exposure held constant and both Chi-67 primary antibodies and secondary antibody conjugates run at the same concentration, 
Kaiser Center kind of detected with Alexa 594 clearly has a more higher signal to noise ratio over Alexa 405. Additional signal application further improves signal to noise. The amplified gamma H text plus Psi 5 run at one tenth of the non amplified concentration outperforms as noted by the linear intensity profiles. A clear strength and one of the main reasons we appreciate UltraView's assay is the approach to signal enhancement through linear amplification. This is critical for my group as we deal with archival samples which can be unpredictable at best and often have issues with autofluorescence. This is a plot of autofluorescence for multiple tissues with multiple fixatives and storage ages from source blocks. While the trend is the same, starting high in the 400 nanometer range and diminishing towards the 800 nanometers, the amplitude varies greatly. A well-sorted amplification strategy can mitigate some of this by exposing out the AF, the autofluorescence. Here, the beta catena in orange is amplified, and the other fluorophores were detected without amplification. Since the capture was quick enough in the beta catenin channel, the underlying red blood cells autofluorescence was not captured and would not pose an issue during analysis. On the last slide, I, look, I present a simplified model of the three assays discussed today and the corresponding analysis output we generate from each. First, Yes, the manual annotations could address limitations of single-plex IHC, but for this purpose, we are assuming automated detection in targeted regions. With single-plex IHC, we can expect getting the number of cells that are marker positive and some spatial data between the cells, such as analyzing for cell clusters. For duplex IHC, we include all the data from the single-plex IHC, and now we have a phenotyping marker like PANCK that lets us separate regions and analyze content plus or minus the phenotyping marker and proximity too. Multiplex IF allows us to do all of the prior, but now adding the multi-marker cell phenotyping and the spatial relationships between those cells and one or more phenotyping markers. In the end, all these assays have their place in the molecular pathology lab comes down to a question of balancing the analytical need to the lab's infrastructure and support, samples, throughput, and ultimately cost. As an early preview, here's an example of an image from our Aplex Multiplex IF we worked with UltraView to help develop. The markers include CD3, CD4, CD8, CD68, FOXP3, PD1, PDL1, and PAN cytokeratin. We plan to use this panel to assess the tuberous microenvironment on breast and lung cancer samples. As shown here, we'll develop, we will be able to pull a number of distinct cell phenotypes, including uh, proximity data associated with each. The high resolution and fidelity of the marker data is critical to our success. Our success. All of this will be run in our production environment and we are very much excited to be partnering with UltraView and look forward to collaborating more in the future. With that, I would like to thank all these folks that made this possible. Thank you for your time, and now we'll open up to live questions. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Katir, both for your informative presentations. Now, as Scott mentioned, we will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. To our audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. We have so many great questions already coming in. Let's start with this one. Gentlemen, can you talk more on the process to swap one or more markers to make a custom aplex, such as novel targets, clone selection, time to deliver? Sure. Uh, so this is Katir. Uh, thank you, Christy, for that question. And thank you to the, uh, everyone that attended the webinar today. 
Um, so with that, uh, all of you can actually swap in, in as many markers uh, that are novel or new um, that we need to. Um, so even if it's a proprietary target or a marker that we haven't worked with in the past, uh, we really have to just do a monoplex optimization, and then we can include it into our assay uh, with you know any of the markers that we've already kind of presented here today. Thank you, Katir. Our next question. With this technology, can you detect surface and intracellular markers at the same time? Yes, we absolutely can. Um, I think if you take a look at the end of uh, Scott's presentation, um, you can actually see a couple of co-localizations of multiple, multiple markers in different cellular compartments, such as looking at, um, you know, Tregs, for example, we have CD3, CD4 as surface markers, but you're also detecting Spox B3 as a nuclear marker as well. Yeah, and if um, this is Scott, if I could just tag a little bit on that. Um, in our experience, we don't really have too much of an issue between uh, looking at the different spaces, uh, particularly with the uh, FFPE section. Um, we've had some concern when we do fresh cells and um, looking at cytopreps, uh, but um, in our experience with FFPE, there hasn't been an issue detecting them in multiple locations. Yeah, and I think many of the challenges most people typically face are usually trying to detect multiple markers within the same cellular com compartment. So, you know, maybe trying to look at one or, you know, one to, you know, two to three markers rather um, within the nucleus or two to three markers on the cell surface. Um, some other technologies typically run into steric hindrance issues. Um, but with our technology, we, we do not really see that problem. Thank you. Can you have artifacts and background signals sometimes? And if so, how do you deal with it? So a quick point I can make on that is, you know, uh, we, you know with fluorescent IHC and many uh, regular standard IHC protocols, uh, you know, background issues are always something that pop up. Um, with our assay, we don't actually use any secondary antibodies. So the amount of nonspecific and background signal that you typically see with standard primary secondary antibody type stains, uh, we eliminate a, quite a bit of that. Um, and also by using fluorescence, you have a higher signal to background ratio, uh, meaning that even if you do have very slight or faint artifacts, uh, that signal is generally so low, it's not being picked up by any analysis algorithm. And it's something that you really visually can't even pick up on compared to the, uh, the bright intensity of your positive signal. Yeah, and, um, you know, I concur, you know, with here, I think if we look at that one slide that I had with the um, representation for the autofluorescence, the, what we see is that with these amplification technologies, um, the signal can generally overcome uh, a lot of autofluorescence that's present in the sample. And, um, you know, you're going to still have issues with fold and all those kind of things with artifacts of sample handling and sectioning. It's kind of why we always very much suggest good wet lab procedures to generate the best quality section samples and images ultimately in the end for data analysis. But um, the technology definitely enhances them, um, kind of the artifact mitigation that we would see in a traditional conventional multiplex IF. How many slides can I stain and, and image in a workday? So I'll, I'll comment for what we can do internally, um, for, you know, through our services uh, lab and what they've typically done with our with our fourplex assay. They can easily get up to 60 slides done in a day. Um, you know, depending on what your shifts look like, you could even push that number upwards to close to 90. Um, for the higher plex workflow, um, you can definitely get 30 slides completed in a day um, as well. Um, but Scott, then, you know, feel free to comment on what your experience has been in um, in, in, in your specific laboratory. Yeah. So. Um, when we fully expect to launch the Apeplex uh, this fall, it looks like we're going to be processing um, in production about 45 slides a day at full production, and that's including staining, imaging, registering, and analysis. Um, our project, as it stands right now, is about six to 800 slides, so we'll definitely be leveraging that. That's on one auto stainer. We use the uh, Lycabon Max. I think we're getting a second one onboarded as well, so that might also improve our throughput. Um, the imager we use is the Zeiss Axioscan V1, and that certainly has capacity to support two auto stainers. So it's potential we can get up to 90-ish uh, slides a day, but that's really pushing it 
So I think we were comfortable at 45, and um, I think that's what we'll likely uh, target with Aplex. Now, Scott Kassir, can I mix and match markers across the kits? So uh, as of right now, the kits are fixed, um, but you can see that we're kind of coming out with this newer Aplex workflow that's going to be, you know, formally released uh, in the next coming months. Uh, but I'd stay tuned until uh, about mid to early June, um, where you'll start to hear some more um, offerings where those types of um, options will become a little bit more readily available from both of you. Katir, are you considering 12 or more Plex to be possible and routine in the future with UltraView technology? We're always considering the higher number of Plex. Uh, that's always a common question we get from, uh, from the field. Uh, right now, we're really focusing on making the 12 Plex as robust and um, you know, efficient as possible. Um, it's just as we have done with uh, the 8 Plex, and you know, we've got the 8 Plex to a place where it's readily uh, deployable to the field now. Uh, the 12 Plex is you know, being held within our services depart uh, laboratory currently, uh, but we're working on that technology to make it more robust to be able to be field deployable. But it's it's hard to say whether you know what the what the next wave is going to look like. But we're always considering um, being able to increase our plex. Thank you. Now, is there a problem with Eosin autofluorescence autofluorescence interference when multiplexing on an HE slide? Great question, um, and I think I, maybe I wasn't as clear as I should have been for that part, but when we actually run the ESN, um, you know, the H&E um, of a multiplex fluorescent slide, we basically run our multiplex fluorescent assay first, capture that image once you're as satisfied with that image and that image quality, then we would run the ESN, um, the H&E, sorry, um, afterwards, um, and then acquire your bright field image. Uh, once you've actually stained with ESN um, and hematoxylin, you really won't be able to go back to your fluorescent um, um, aspect of the tissue and uh, re-image it. So uh, it's really important that you capture your fluorescent image the way you want it uh, before you actually start the H and E process. Thank you, Katir. Now, does the number of markers used on a slide affect downstream data analysis? For example, is it better to do a few markers on many slides or highly multiplexed in one? So um, I, I can address this one right off. Um, so. It really kind of depends on what your questions are, and what you know, your what your um, experimental design and your hypothesis is. Um, if it, if you just need to get density of say CD3 cells, um, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to throw in several markers, tens of markers, onto a slide. That just makes the the process more cumbersome, labor intensive, costly potentially, and you're really not getting an advantage. Um, I'd say where you want to run multiple markers in a high multiple situation is when you have specific questions on these relationships between uh, the markers you're looking for. Do you really need to look at rich, you know, spatial relationships, say PDL1 tumor cells and the tumor microenvironment, CD8 cells, et cetera, adjacent to? Are you looking at relationships between CD31 stained blood vessels and other targets? Uh, that's when you start wanting to stack the data on each other. and also, you know, if you're trying to pick a, a you know, certain cell phenotype, as we take a look in our Aplex, if I can get this here, and you want to look at these certain phenotypes, then you're going to need to do the kind of uh, high plex uh, single slide registration with all these markers. Um, for instance, we're looking at exhausted T cells. For instance, have this phenotype here, which is CD3 PDL1. Or PD ones rather positive, so that's kind of when you want to put the effort in to, to doing this large data analysis. Otherwise, I would say that if you're just looking at um, T cell populations, then uh, you might be better off with a single plex IHC. Thank you, Scott. Our next question. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this great presentation. How can we avoid cross reactions between the same source animal isolated monoclonal antibodies? Now, different antibodies might have different affinities. So, should we perform different antigen retrieval protocols at the same time for multi staining? So, I can take it, I can take that question. Um, so, we don't use secondary antibodies. Uh, we actually use the DNA barcodes, amplify those, and then come in with complementary imaging strands conjugated to fluorophores to actually detect those primary antibodies that are laid down. Um, and since we're not using secondaries uh, and we're using those barcode conjugates to do the detection, 
Um, we can have any species of antibodies in our primary antibody cocktail. They can be from source from mouse or rabbit. It does not matter. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? I apologize. No problem. Now, different antibodies might have different affinities. So should we perform different antigen retrieval protocols at the same time for multi-staining? So, you know, here at Ultraview, we make sure we optimize all our antibodies uh, for a pH 9 antigen retrieval or ER2 on the bond. Um, and we haven't come across anything yet um, that has required variant um, ways of doing antigen retrieval like a pH 6 or something like that. Uh, most good high-performance antibodies that are on the market today um, are usually uh, amenable to using a pH 9 antigen retrieval. So we've been able to standardize Thanks. quite regularly on that. Very good. Do you have antibody panels useful for mouse tissue? Great question. Um, that's something we are always looking into. Um, nothing commercially yet, uh, but through our services uh, laboratory, we could put together mouse-specific panels uh, without issue. Thank you. How long can we expect the fluorescence to be expressing on the slides and detectable? So that's another great question. Um, our fluorophores are incredibly stable. Um, you know, if you're using a good, fast um, whole slide scanner that has minimal, you know, that minimizes photo bleaching and, and light exposure to the slide itself, uh, we can get repeat scans of, you know, up to 100 acquisitions um, over a 6 to 12 month period without any problem. Uh, general storage is usually 4 degrees in the dark, but um, I, I can say from my own experience, I've had slides that I've had in my own, my, my own bag for things like demos for well over 6 months uh, just in the dark, and they still perform just fine with very minimal changes in uh, exposure time. Thank you, Katir. Now, do you have field scientists to help show how to do this and help set up the system? Absolutely. Um, I think it's a great offering that we have here at AltaView that we always send out a field application scientist for uh, demos, trainings, and even impl implementations. Uh, we really want customers to be successful with our reagents. I think it's something that the field has generally struggled with, that sometimes you know people are left to their own devices without a lot of specific guidance when working with complex reagents and complex assays. So you know, having someone there that that's you know well um, well trained in that space to walk you through it and you know check out the workflow and infrastructure that you have on site and to basically be able to help consult you with these uh, projects and assays is something we absolutely offer and uh, we take a lot of pride in um, doing that and you know interacting with our customers face-to-face. -face. Thank you, Katir. Will multi-spectral multi imaging and unmixing enhance the results or is it unnecessary? So um, I could just talk from our experience. Um, we, we did a, take a really quick look or a close look at multispectral imaging and, of course, the technology. And there's a lot of good things about multispectral imaging, but what some of the challenge with it is very sensitive to the, uh, I guess, the expression of each marker and its, and its uh, proximity to each other. So one marker can easily overbalance another marker, and it makes it tough to balance. So there's a lot of optimization that needs to be done. And I'm sure Katir will talk a little bit more about this, but uh, with the UltraView technology, each channel is spectrally separated sufficiently where you don't see the spectral overlap. So unmixing is uh, generally unnecessary. Yeah, that's a great point, Scott. And uh, just to just to add on to what you just said there, um, you know, when you actually have to do spectral unmixing, um, it's it, it's required to balance the fluorescent signal for each one of the channels or each one of your markers, right? So that means is in order to to efficiently spectrally unmix the image. So when you're turning up or turning down channels to get them within a specific range of exposures, um, you're artificially kind of adjusting the amount of signal that's truly coming from the tissue or from the, uh, the proteins that are present on that slide. Um, so that's what makes the optimization quite uh, difficult, and it actually kind of skews maybe what you're observing from a biological perspective and can, uh, you know, you're basically turning a low expressor into a brighter expressor and a high expressor and turning that down into like more of a medium expressor just to be able to unmix the image. Um, and the idea of being using spectral unmixing is to eliminate that spectral overlap and bleed through uh, fluorophores that are very close. Um, you know, we use uh, fluor uh, fluorescent dyes that are well, uh, very well spectrally isolated from each other, meaning you don't have to worry about that crosstalk or bleed through from channel to channel. Um, and since we're not doing any sort of unmixing, the signal you're seeing um, from, you know, a pixel intensity perspective is representative of what is biologically happening within that tissue. 
Thank you both. Can this multiplex IF be applied on cytochemistry? So I have a, a lot of experience doing a multiplex IF on um, cytochemistry uh, preps, and I haven't actually tried ultimus technology on it, so I would be curious on what um, Kathir would say about it. But in my experience with multiplex IF on cytochemistry, it, it's really highly dependent on how the samples are, or cells rather are fixed and prepped. Um, as I think we had an earlier question about looking at the different uh, cellular spaces, membrane, cytoplasm, nucleus. Typically with uh, cytochemistry or cell preps, uh, the, those membranes can be easily disrupted and um, can diminish membrane signal to get into the nuclei and staying for nuclear signal. So it is a tricky balance, um, and there's kind of multiple fixation strategies that can be applied to get the best of both worlds. But um, I can't speak specifically on the uh, ultimate and cytoplex for cytochemistry itself. Yeah, so from my perspective, we haven't had it. We actually haven't tested that yet. Um, it's something that we've discussed internally, and it may be something that we evaluate at a later date. But uh, right now, we don't have any data to, uh, to, to say how successful we were or were not at um, staying those types of samples. Thank you. Now, we have time for a few more questions, but I do want to remind our audience that those questions that we are unable to answer live today and those that do come in during the on-demand period, they will be answered by our speakers via the email address you provided at the time of registration. We do have quite a few questions that have come in, and we for sure will not be able to get to them today, but they will be answered. So let's continue. Can the Ultimapper assay be used on fresh sections that have not been embedded in paraffin? So uh, we don't test that internally formally, um, but we have some customers that are evaluating that right now as we speak. Um, and it kind of speaks to the same point that Scott had just made. Um, you know, the, they will require some fixation processing um, in that, you know, working that out and optimizing that is what would be required to see if our assay would work optimally there or not. Um, another consideration to take there, too, is that most standard IHC um, antibodies are uh, derived against epitopes that have undergone uh, specific types of fixation. So sometimes secondary sets of antibodies need to be used in order to uh, optimally stain epitopes within fresh frozen, meaning an antibody that works really well in FFPE may not work as well in fresh frozen. Is there a trial and error required to eliminate background? Uh, from our uh, optimization perspective, not really. Um, you know, we really optimize a primary antibody first, uh, and then we really just need to optimize the appropriate amount of um, imaging strands. But that's pretty turnkey um, at this point for the amount of development we've done on the numerous markers that we have. Yeah, and uh, just to back on Katir, that um, so you know our experience with uh, the ultimate and Cetoplex versus conventional IF, a lot of that's been taken care of, which. Is really a, a, a large weight off of the lab trying to, you know, as I mentioned, optimize on. It's very difficult to get that and exclude background and, and a noise. The turnkey solution, the ultimate view, has been tremendously helpful, and um, I think that's a, a very um, a strong advantage of the technology and then in the course of linear application, which uh, reduces a lot of that issue. Yeah, maybe maybe Scott, you could comment on um, how much time it typically took your lab. Uh, to develop a standard, you know, fourplex assay or something using some other type of maybe chromogenic multiplex or other fluorescent platform? Sure, yeah. I mean, we, so we do a chromogenic. Um, generally, as I kind of mentioned in my presentation, we, it, we don't go above two too much because then all those uh, the chromogens can sort of blend and it gets more difficult to uh, deconvolute the signal from one another. But with fluorescence, um, of course, the issue with fluorescence is not just uh, the optimizing antibody concentration, you also have that possibly the secondary concentration unless you directly conjugate it, but then you also have very low signal. So it's really a balance of signal to and the affinity and vidity of the target that you're looking at. But then you also have to balance it against which channel that works best in relative to your antibody. And then you have to look at according to your on-prem equipment to make sure it balances out and spec that out properly. That process just to get set up is pretty uh, time consuming, but I think in our experience, we were routinely six or eight months to get a fourplex panel IF into production, um, and it was a significant amount of effort on our team. Thank you, gentlemen. And we'll wrap with this final question. 
what kind of expertise is needed to use your technology? So I think that's one of the beauties of our technology um, is that, you know, and it, it kind of spins off of what Scott was just referring to, is that we really re, uh, pre-optimize these assays for you, uh, meaning the development and optimization of each individual marker and then the multiplex afterwards is something that you do not need to do. And that in the past has required a lot of expertise and a lot of time, as Scott has mentioned, um, in order to do so. So, you know, being able to deliver pre-optimized kits is something we can do fast and quick. Um, and assuming the site has, um, you know, the proper infrastructure to do the scanning and the scanning, um, you know, we can really get anybody up and trained on how to run this assay. Thank you both for this excellent Q&A session. Do either of you have any final comments for our audience? Sure. I just want to say thank you to everybody for taking the time to sit on this webinar today. And I want to say a big thank you to Scott and the Lido's team. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, they were really the impetus for us to develop this new 8plex workflow for the field. Um, you know, as I said before, it's something that we had just kept as an internal technology with our services business, but Scott's been very much a pioneer in the space. Um, and him and his team have been an absolute pleasure to work with um, and to help us, you know, get us to the next level as well. So thank you all and thank you, Scott. Yep. Um, thank you, Katir, and um, thank you, everyone else, for taking time out and listening to our, our talk, and um, stay safe, everyone. Thank you both. And before we go, I do want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Again, we had quite a few questions we were unable to answer, so those questions and additionally the questions that are submitted during the on-demand period, they will be addressed by our speakers via the email address that you provided during the time of registration. I'd like to once again thank Scott Lawrence and Dr. Katir Patel for their time today and for their important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, UltaView, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you today via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.